Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden number 8. And first up, I would like to welcome all recurring viewers. Thank you for coming back to our meetup, Funk Prog Sweden. And to all new viewers or first time watchers, welcome to also welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. This is the meetup where we explore functional programming and functional programming languages. Um, and today we're not just going to explore a functional programming language. I'll head over to the agenda. Today we are going to get an introduction to functional programming in Go by Karsten. And on the second topic we'll do ChatGPT as your Erlang coach by Georgiana. It's going to be a very interesting meetup today. First up, I would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabeat. Adabeat is an IT consulting company focused on functional programming. If you want to know more about Adabeat, check them out on adabeat.com or on social media. And the coming schedule then, we'll do another meetup, of course, in December, and then another one in January, and then in February. For January and February, we haven't set the dates yet, but we'll come back with that and announce them as soon as we have presenters. And if you want to support the Funk Prog Sweden community, you head over to Meetup and join the community. And you hit subscribe somewhere here on the subscribe button for our channel. And if you have questions, want to talk to other people, what, what is functional programming all about? head over to the Discord channel and you'll find all the links and everything in the About section. If you have questions during your presentation, uh, please ask them either in the Discord server or here on the YouTube chat. With that said, let's get started. Uh, our first presenter, Introduction to FP Go, Functional Programming for Golang by Karsten. Welcome, Karsten, to Funk Prog Sweden. Hey, my name is Karsten Loyer. Um, I've been a software developer for IBM for around 20 years now. And recently, we have um, published an open source library in the, with the Apache 2 license that introduces or uh, that makes it uh, the made functional programming available for the Go language. I'm actually feeling very honored to be to have been invited over to the Funk Prox Sweden uh, meetup to talk to you about this library. And uh, I would be very happy to engage in some discussion about um, this library uh, at the end of this presentation. So what will we talk about? Um, first, um, in this presentation, I would like to motivate um, why it makes sense to have functional programming uh, for Go. Go, in the first place, is, a, is an imperative language. It's designed to be an imperative language. So why does it make sense to use functional programming concepts in this imperative language? And why does it help to have a library um, to, to support you doing so? Um, in the second part, we will have a closer look at uh, how Go code using this functional um, extension, I would say, to uh, to Go looks like Go code that uses this um, FP Go library. Um, we'll delve into some of the concepts uh, that the library has to offer, and again, we will we will have a look at at, um, at code. It will not be a <clears throat> complete in depth in investigation into the library. Um, I would like to concentrate on some of the aspects. Uh, to give you some motivation to look at the library if you find this um, helpful. Um, I would like to conclude my presentation with some performance considerations and a quick discussion on my view on whether it made sense uh, to, to introduce this library and a couple of thoughts about this. Um, so this library has been published uh, and open sourced by IBM. Uh, with me as the maintainer of the library. But I still want to make sure that in this very presentation, I am presenting this as an individual and there are no obligations whatsoever with respect to plans um, 
or for the future, future of this library um, that you can derive from this presentation. Just a legal disclaimer. And I would also make sure um, to, to mention that the library FPGO has largely been influenced by the awesome TypeScript library FPTS by Giulio Canti. So this is um, a library that brings functional programming concepts to TypeScript into the JavaScript world. And uh, at least to me, even after so many years of software development, it has been a revelation on how the application of functional programming concepts in JavaScript, which, which I've used for a long time uh, before finding this library, uh, how this library made it easier and more concise uh, to write a TypeScript code. The actual, the actual bait for me was, was this IOTS library, which is a dynamic type checking system for TypeScript. If you work with TypeScript or JavaScript, I recommend to make sure to check these libraries out. And you will find that um, the FPGO library is largely influenced and follows many of the same concepts as this FPTS library. Um, as a starter, I would like um, to talk a little bit about my personal journey um, to functional programming. Um, I mentioned that I've worked for a long time, 20, more than 20 years in software development. I'm um, actually a physicist and after my PhD in physics, I have decided to turn my passion for coding, which I've always had since my youth, so, so to say, uh, to turn this into uh, into a living and I joined IBM um, around the year 2000. And during my career, I've worked as a software developer, as a software architect in, in changing roles on a, on, a, on a large set of very interesting and challenging projects. And this timeline is supposed to show a bit what programming languages came across my way. It started um, with the development on a large scale portal server system uh, around the year 2000 um, for, for like around 10 years. And at that time, a portal server had to be implemented in, in J2E. It's, that was the, the platform of choice and the language of choice, of course, on J2E is Java. We developed both backend and frontend. Um, Front end. And that was the time when this, this term Web 2.0 came up. So when the JavaScript portion of the application code became more and more relevant and important, which uh, led to experience in client-side frameworks for the, for the client-side UI layer. And uh, the frameworks I've worked in was Angular, which introduced me to TypeScript, and React, which introduced me to a couple of very interesting uh, programming patterns. But both frameworks have in common. They are both JavaScript based in the end and, and client side. And JavaScript, of course, is also like a language that's been mandated by doing front end coding because it has to be JavaScript to be run uh, in, a, in a browser um, in the front end. Um, so after the experience in the portal server world, <coughs> we developed um, a content management system based on microservices. These microservices were coded in Node and partially in Java. Uh, the languages of choice, in this case, JavaScript for the Node or TypeScript for the Node um, version was due to this good scalability in the microservices world um, of TypeScript and Java because the team was just proficient in Java. And so we, we used Java and we used uh, like Vertex as a, as a framework there. Um, more recently, I've been more involved in mainframe applications. I have been more involved in mainframe applications, secure applications, um, and also applications that uh, get got integrated here as cloud services into the IBM cloud. And the languages of choice in this area were Python, um, Go, Rust, and TypeScript again. Um, Python, because the team was proficient in Python. Um, TypeScript basically in this case for testing purposes and Go, um, which is the reason I'm giving this talk now, Go because the um, cloud community is dominated by Go, I would say. 
many of the large scale um, libraries, frameworks, and solutions are implemented in Go. And if you want to integrate with these libraries, uh, then you better write, write do it in Go or it's more complicated. For example, if you want to integrate into, um, into Docker or if you want to integrate as an operator into a Kubernetes service, then uh, the ecosystem and the libraries of choice are, are coded in Go. Um, and again, this is what led to the development of this library. Um, you might have noticed that the languages of choice during my journey here, uh, they are all imperative languages. And um, so I've also thought about what's, what's the reason for the choice of languages actually. And it turned out that in most cases, um, there were non-functional factors, I would say, for the choice of language. Either it, it was, has been a platform requirement in the J2E case, there was just no option uh, to implement um, a, a portal server in another in a different language other than Java. Sometimes you need to integrate into different into existing ecosystems. It's, it's the team's skill set that dominates the choice of language or its, or its industry trends. Um, but in, in any case, the in or in all cases, the decision for the language had not been dominated by features of the language, such as functional features of a programming language. We rather pretty much had to stick with languages for different reasons. Um, and of, of course, over um, this long time in development, there's, there's some key aspects that occur to me that were always challenging in, um, in my experience, independent of the actual language we were working in. Sometimes languages make it easier, uh, sometimes harder, but um, I always, we always, well, I always stumbled across these aspects. And first of all, uh, the testability aspect of a solution. Um, in many cases, um, projects are driven um, on, on, a, on a tight schedule. Uh, time to market is a really important aspect. And this can lead to code that is not as testable as you would, would want it to have. Let's put it that way. Um, for example, um, in an ideal world, you have you would have a code that is completely covered with unit tests. With unit tests, um, then you would write integration tests and, and get a coverage as complete as possible. But it turned out that it's really easy, and I would say it's easy in imperative languages in particular, to write code in a way that it is not easily testable. For example, it's very easy in imperative languages to add side effects to existing code, um, such as updates to shared state um, or reading, writing to external sources such as databases. And as soon as you have that inter intermangled with your code base, then it's hard to write a unit test for such code because you never know if there's a, an ordering dependency in your test case, uh, if, it mod if it alters a shared state, or if your databases or your backend systems have to be set up in a particular way in order to make your function testable. This is all solvable. You either using mocks or using um, setup functions, but in, this makes the development of test cases difficult, more difficult than it needs to be. Another aspect, and that is related to shared state, I would say, and the intermingling of, of different aspects in, um, in, uh, in the code you're writing is um, the ability to refactor code. If your code changes some shared properties of the system, then you never know if you can factor that, one, that piece of code out because you do never know if other code depends as a side effect on these modifications of shared state. Um, race conditions, of course, are also a problem if um, you consider shared state. And uh, certain, yeah, it, it boils down to really it's basically to state management. Um, and I would say, in hindsight, uh, well, let, let, let put, let's put it that way. Um, not, of course, not all code 
suffers from these deficiencies. Um, there's, it is very well possible to write code that is testable in a good way in imperative languages. And in, in hindsight, it turned out that much of that code followed principles you would also find um, in functional programming. And this is what actually motivated me to look more into the realm of functional programming to get a better sense of the abstractions that also helps not just in functional languages, but also in languages that are imperative in nature and that just lead to better code. And on this slide, I have summarized a couple of aspects um, of functional programming that I find um, very helpful. Of course, this is not a complete set, um, but these would be my favorites. Um, the idea of pure functions, of course, like a function that produces the same output um, just depending on the input that doesn't have any side effects. It doesn't modify input parameters, shared state whatsoever. It could in principle be replaced by, by a lookup table. But such a function, of course, is an ideal. Um, it is very well testable and um, the attempt to structure your code base with pure functions leads to a to reusable and very testable um, code. The second aspect is the idea of composition, where instead of um, dispatching calls to other functions from your function, so and, and by so you would create a, a tight coupling between functions, you would um, structure your code as as pure functions and and move the layer to um, or the, the uh, move the ordering of calling these functions out of the function by composing them using well known and standardized composition functions. And we'll, we'll see this in a in an example later on. Um, I mentioned before that it, in the uh, testability argument, um, one of the main problems is. Uh, is our side effects. So, so side effects in the sense that you modify either shared state or you read write from an external system. Uh, because as soon as you introduce a side effect, you never know if there's ordering dependencies and it's, you have non-reproducible effect on the function. But in reality, every, every meaningful program has side effects. I've not, not encountered a single problem where side effects would not be needed. You typically have to talk to, uh, to different systems. You have to perform I.O. But the um, what, what makes side effects manageable from a functional programming perspective is the idea to model them in a specific way, to model them as managed side effects. And so, the, so you can clearly identify a function that has a side effect and tell it apart from a function that does not have a side effect, that improves on readability and the ability to reason about your code. And it also makes it possible to first compose your, your program in a pure way and then apply side effects only at the very end of the cycle. And this, to me, is a very good way to deal with side effects in a, in a functional world. Immutability is another key aspect. Uh, typically in or often in uh, imperative languages, um, you find that data structures are mutable. And often this is done with the argument that then the uh, performance of the, the overall performance of the, pro of the program is, um, is improved because um, some algorithms can be implemented much more efficiently on mutable data structures than in immutable data structures. However, as soon as you have mutability in your problem in your uh, in your code, it's <clears throat> much harder to to reason about this, to understand side effects, to understand uh, the effects of refactoring. So, introducing immutability wherever possible, even if the language does not enforce that, is a great value in my eyes. And last, I would I have it here as a map filter reduce. I could extend the list. The idea is that um, there exist an, a, quite a number of concepts of abstractions 
such as the map filter reduce pattern, I could add here chain applicatives, whatever, that are that are common across different types of data structures, such as arrays, records, ethers, whatsoever. But so you have a set of common monadic functions that can be applied to a huge variety of data structures. And as soon as you understand the logical concept of these functions, um, no matter what data structure you apply to, you understand the effect on that data structure. That makes code that follows these patterns very readable, and in my experience, much more readable than code that is not using these patterns. So that's, and if I had to choose uh, two of these features um, as my, as the most important ones from function, uh, for, for out of the functional programming world, I would say man the ability to tell apart managed side effects from pure functions is one of the key features and uh, the attempt to handle data structures as immutable as possible is the second one that I would find the most valuable. So then why <coughs> have you selected Go uh, for, for this, this library? Go has been designed to be an imperative language, explicitly not to be a functional language. But as I motivated in the very beginning, sometimes the choice of language is not determined based on the features of the language, but because of the ecosystems of the libraries you have to interact with. And Go has quite a bit of pluses on, on its side. It has a huge ecosystem of libraries that you can interact with. Um, for my work, there we, we often need good crypto libraries, so it has very good implementation of these crypto libraries. It has um, I could say it has a library for everything. So a huge and very well reusable ecosystem uh, that you can interact with. Um, also, I would say it has a really good concurrency model. Concurrency in a, in a, in a programming language is also important if you deal with server-side languages because you want to you want to be able to handle many requests in parallel. You want to potentially make different requests to outbound systems. And uh, ideally, you, you want to do this in a concurrent way. Um, traditionally, such as in Java, um, concurrency is modeled as threads or even processes, which are quite heavyweight. Go has, a, has, has the model of what they call Go routines, which is something like, maybe I've heard the term green threads for that. It's basically, a concurrency model that is modeled by the Go runtime um, on top of um, operating system threads, but in a way that the overhead to spawn such a Go routine is very small. So the idea is that you can have like thousands or even tens of thousands of these Go routines, maybe not tens of thousands of outbound connections, but at least Go routines that run logically concurrently, of course, not in parallel. And uh, the runtime takes care of that. So that is very convenient. Um, another key feature for us is the um, compiler tool chain. It's, it's really easy to get started with Go and to, uh, and to compile and run binaries. Um, there's no complicated library setup. It's all integrated. Um, you basically initialize your Go module, you get your dependencies, and you can compile it. And that's really a no-brainer, and it works really stable and really well. And one of the side aspects of this that is very important or that is very useful is the fact that the binaries that are created by Go are fully self-contained. Um, there's not even a dependency on the C library, as you would normally see uh, in the comp in compilation results. The reason is that Go has decided, the Go development team has decided to implement even low level functions, not against the C library, but directly against the kernel functions. Um, so you basically have a zero dependency binary. The only dependency is the dependency on the kernel. And that makes it easy to transfer binaries um, between systems to install them. You don't have to be worried about version incompatibilities of uh, dependent libraries or whatsoever. 
Um, another aspect in particular for us on the, in the mainframe world is that Go supports cross compilation in a, in a really convenient way. Uh, so you can start, you can develop your code like on an x86 system and then cross compile it on the same system to different architectures and then just run it there. It's, it's, it's all integrated and it's, it's again a no brainer setup. And again, and the last part is compilation is fast, which is, is good during development time. And it's very well integrated uh, into IDEs. Excuse me a second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. So these are all aspects in favor of using Go. Uh, and of course, side of non-functional constraints, because you need to integrate into Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, whatever, you better use Go as your language of choice. Um, but I don't want to hide that there are also reasons why you do not want to implement functional programming in Go. And, um, and one is the designers of Go have clearly designed Go to be an imperative language. And that is, that leads to like a guide of idiomatic Go style that they suggest that the Go designers suggest you follow. And this idiomatic Go style is not necessarily what looks like functional code. So if you integrate maybe into a, an existing um, Go project with a code reviews that enforce idiomatic Go style, then maybe this library is not for you in this case, because at some places, and I will discuss in which ones, it does not follow the idiomatic Go style, but it implements a functional style for reasons I think make sense, but which are not meant to be implemented that way by the um, Go designers, Go Lang designers. And then third, I would say a key feature of Go that makes it possible to write this functional library, this FP Go library, is the the concept of generics. Generics is the term in Go for uh, type parameters. Instead of so, instead of having instead of having um, hard coded types, you can make the type itself a parameter. That's what they call generics. Generics had been added to the Go language relatively late, just uh, in the beginning of 2022, and the type system is still evolving. So it's in no way comparable, in my eyes, uh, to what Haskell has to offer. Um, but it's still very useful, but it also puts constraints in what we can do in Go. And we'll discuss this uh, on the next slides. On the flip side, um, there are also some features in Go that are functional programming friendly and, and help with writing um, functional, functional style Go, I'll say it that way. Again, generics. <laughs> This is a one of the key enabling factors, um, and it had been uh, added to Go in 1.18, in version 1.18 in 2022. Um, <clears throat> other Go features that are helpful in this area are um, the ability to write higher order functions. This means functions, you can write functions that return other functions, functions themselves in Go are just objects, data structures, just like any other data structure, just like a struct, a pointer, um, an integer, whatever. You can assign them to variables, you can pass them around, or you can return them as the result of, fun uh, of other functions. So this is very helpful. And uh, the FPGO library makes quite a bit of use of this uh, feature. Closures are also very important. This is also full, fully supported by the Go language. Closure means that um, the like, parameters on a function that returns another function are captured in that other function. I, I, will, I will show an example later on. Um, so as a summary, functions are first class entities in Go, and that is extremely helpful in like writing functional code and developing this library. 
And of course, the strong typing aspect of Go. Go is a strongly typed library in contrast like to JavaScript or Python or whatever. And um, having strong type constraints uh, makes Gives you, gives you the confidence, gives you a lot of confidence that your code is, is okay um, just by, by looking at the types. It also makes it much easier to understand um, an existing function. If you look at the function declaration, you understand the, the types of the declaration. And with the idea in the background that we follow a functional style and that functions like are pure, or if it's, if it's an IO related function, then it has a spe special syntax. It, you can immediately make out from the um, from the signature of a function um, what it's supposed to do. And this is supported by a strong typing feature of Go. So let's have a quick look just as a really 10 seconds introduction into the Go syntax, how, such, how this looks like. Here in this example, we have two functions, the add ins function and the add numbers function. And the first one with the integers uses explicit typing. Um, I mean, first you see every function starts with a func um, keyword, then the name of the functions, then the parameters, and each parameter has to have a type. So we have two integer types, a return type of int, and we just compute this sum here. Um, prior to the introduction of generics in Go, if you wanted to have the same function for, say, not ints, but floats, uh, or, the, or doubles or whatever, then uh, you would have to write a different function explicitly using uh, int float signatures, or you would have to do type introspection using um, a generic like any or interface type, which of course is not ideal if you want to have type safety. With the introduction of generics, which you can see in the second example here, um, we can make the actual type a parameter, a variable of the function. And we do this in these square brackets after the function name. We see that we have introduced T as a type constraint. Then we can use T across our, our parameter definition and our return type. And uh, the part after the T is a restriction on the possible types of T. In this case, it's restricted to be of a, of a number type. This number type comes actually from the FPGO library. It's basically a union from of all types that have the, uh, the semantic of being a number. I think in the meantime, it has also been introduced in the Go base library, but at the time of writing, it had not. So this basically says you can call this library like with an integer float, complex number, whatever. And the logic of building the sum, of course, is always the same. At compile time, the compiler will um, compile this into an explicit version of the function. So at compile time, the compiler needs to know what's, what is t, what's the value of t, and then it will produce the correct implementation for that, for that value. So if you use the same function for int float, you will have two versions of this in your binary at the end. Um, in my second example, uh, I have an example of how a closure looks like uh, in Go. Um, you can see this here in capture value. Again, we have uh, we, we see that this works very well together with um, generics. In this case, T is the again the type parameter, but it's not constrained. It has the any type. And just for the fun of it, I, I have basically passed, created a function which a captured parameter and it returns another function. You can see this, the return value is a function without parameters returning a string. You can also see that the implementation returns an instance of that function. And in the implementation of that, of it, it references the captured value. And that's what I um, call a closure in this, uh, in this concept, the context, because the captured value does not flow into the parameterless function that is the return value it flows into the function that generates the parameterless function. It's basically captured in that function and available in, in a as a closure. And in the example function, you can see how that would be used in practice. So first um, we call this capture value function with an 
by passing it some explicit value, in this case, a string. The return value will be a function without parameters returning a string. And at the left-hand side of the expression, you can see that we assign it to some variable, which is called HOF for higher order function in this case. Go is um, smart enough, the Go compiler is smart enough to, to detect the return type automatically. So you do not have to put type constraints or type information on this HOF function, that's automatic. In the next line, in the print line, uh, we actually call that function and prints out what we what we expect to have captured that function, uh, that, that input parameter. So um, there are also parts of Go that um, I am that would it would be nice to have these parts uh, in the Go language. Um, first of all, it's immutable data types. Um, I said before that immutable data types is one of my favorites. And we should try to make data, type, data as immutable as possible. Unfortunately, in Go, there's no way to enforce that. Um, the FPGO library in its implementation makes sure it never does mutation or mutate, yeah, it, it never changes data structures. It will always uh, create copies of data structures in, in, you know, hopefully in an efficient way, but it will never change data structures. So, but that is only by by contract, there's no way to enforce that. It would be nice to have this in the language, but there is no const keyword. There's, there's actually no way to do this. Um, it would also be, some, be helpful to have a type parameters for methods. This comes a bit out of the blue here because I have not introduced, and just take, take this at the moment um, as, as a statement. I've shown how type parameters work on functions. In Go, we can also have functions that are associated with data structures, very similar to methods on an object, but it's not possible to give these associated functions their own type parameters. Type parameters can only always be on either on the, uh, on the object itself or on standalone functions, but not on associated functions. And in some cases, it would be helpful to have that. Maybe it comes one day. Functional overloading is also not possible. Um, we'll see the effect of that. Um, so with functional overloading, I mean having a function with the same name, but a, a varying set of parameters. And um, if, if you have a look at the composition functions, uh, pipe and flow, um, we have to work around this limitation. Another limitation is the lack of type variance. Um, so you know that um, in, in some type systems, you can specify whether a type constraint is covariant, contravariant, or invariant. Um, so whether you can pass in a subtype, whether you re can return a subtype, or whether the type we're talking about ha has exactly to be the type as specified. Uh, when dealing with generics in Go, generics are by, by design in Go invariant. So you cannot define a co or contra variants. Uh, this also has some limit, some limit, causes some limitations, um, but it's still possible um, to, to use this um, to a good extent. It would just be easier in some, some cases if you could specify the variants of types. Um, the other aspect is tuples. Um, I'll skip this here a little bit in the interest of time, and we talk about this when we talk about error handling um, in Go, and then we discuss uh, the tuple aspects. And the larger missing feature is higher kinded types. Um, so generics, uh, the current type system in Go, only um, allows you to, to define types in one level. You cannot define a generic type that in turn is typed by another generic type. Again, we see, we, we see an example by when this would be helpful. This leads uh, to, the, um, to the appearance of, of, um, of variations of some of the functions, of explicit variations of some of the functions for the different monads that this library has to offer instead of um, exposing the same functionality just as one single function using higher kind of types. Internally, 
I've tried to implement this still in a way that the actual implementation code is, is not duplicated, but basically the facade that makes this usable has a duplication across the monads because of the, um, of the lack of higher kind of types. Okay, so this is just my summary slide on why does it make sense to create a library such as fbgo for Go. Um, because the introduction of functional patterns motivate and encourage the creation of, um, of pure function or functions that can be well tested. Again, it's possible to do the same using imperative style but following certain functional programming patterns just make it more obvious and more easy to follow that style that leads to testable code. Same goes for the, um, <clears throat> for the um, aspect of making side effects, um, of, of being able to tell side effects apart from pure functions and um, by contract the immutability of data structures. Um, also, by, by having a, a, a rich set of composition functions, I believe we can reduce the boilerplate in, a, in, in our code, which, which leads to less mental um, complexity when trying to follow the code, because you basically can follow the code line by line. Um, and since it's always using the same composition functions, it's easier to read. Um, using monads such as, we will see that, such as option, for example, avoids nested if-l statements, which again, in my eyes, reduces uh, complexity. So let's, in the second part, let's step into the fbgo library and see how this looks like in practice and in reality. Um, so this slide summarizes a bit the different concepts that uh, fbgo has to offer. Um, first, I would say, it offers um, a comprehensive set of functions such as filter, map, filter, reduce, chain, flatten. And uh, I, ha I have a more complete list on one of the, the, the other slides, but it's, it's a list of common apps functions across different data types. Right? And you might recognize these are some of the mon functions that are used in monads. So um, the implementation tries to come up with a set of with a set of monads and implements the same functions across them. So when looking at the code, no matter what data structure you're looking at, you will see the same composition functions, uh, and you can rely upon the fact that these functions exist uh, across the board. Like for example, we have these functions, of course, for built-in data types such as slices. Which are, which are the concept of arrays in Go, slices and maps, which are records in Go. Uh, but we also have them for data types that this library introduces, such as the IO data types, um, either option, readers, whatsoever. Um, so for every uh, data type, you find a common set of recognizable functions. The library also offers um, composition functions. So functions that allow you um, to stick together these map, filter, reduce, chain, whatsoever, these monadic functions in a chain of operations. And we have two of, of these composition functions, the pipe and the flow function, with the difference that the pipe function takes a value and then a set of operation and returns a value. And the flow function um, does not take an initial value, but it but just a sequence of operations and it, it returns a new function that takes the initial value and which is very helpful for, to writing point free style code. Um, and some of the monads that this library implements is the either monad for error handling, um, the optional monad for optional values. Um, we have the IO monad for uh, representation of managed side effects and variations of that, like IO either, IO option, so all, like all combinations. And we have a reader abstraction where um, a reader is, uh, is a data structure that takes a context and then operates on top of that context. And then this also um, 
exists in its different variations, like for um, side effectful operations, we have beta IO. For side effectful operations that can fail, we have EO IO, reader IO, either, and so on. And again, it's a, a consistent set of operations across all of these data types. Um, the library also supports um, abstractions and concrete implementations of different monoids and uh, semigroups. So monoids are data structures that carry an operation that can combine two values of the same type. And um, uh, well, that's a semigroup and a monoid adds to that concept um, an initial value, a zero value. And this concept is very helpful, for example, in the reduce case, where we want to apply a sequence of operations to a set of homogeneous values um, in, a, in a sequence. Um, and um, supporting the claim that the library um, supports immutable data structures, it, it also contains um, an incomplete implementation of functional optics, um, such as lenses, prisms, traversals, which help you to work on immutable data structures. We have an HTTP module, which is a wrapper around the built-in one, and um, an interesting aspect, hopefully, to concurrency, which I will delve on um, in a minute. So uh, it's, how would you use the library? Um, the library is available uh, at the URL you see uh, at the top here. Uh, installation is really simple. You start with uh, your new Go project, or maybe with an existing one. If you want to use a new one, you do a Go mod in it and just a go get of the library, and then uh, you have it installed. Uh, during this presentation, um, I will use um, some notation in order to, in, to, to consume that library. And you can see this sort of in the, in the, in the, in the bottom here. In Go, um, you use the import statement to import uh, libraries, like the format one, or in the lower lines, you see the import of the Go library, of the FP Go library. And I'm typically assigning a shortcut to such an import statement. And you can see the shortcut A for the array import and F for function, for as an example. Um, some may like it, some may not like it, um, that, but that is the that is my, my preferred style. And I'm using this in the, in the following examples here. So let's have a look at how the code looks like. Um, Let's start at the right hand side with um, a map implementation, uh, a sample of map implementation. Um, so I have the same code both in idiomatic Go and um, in functional Go. Uh, you see the idiomatic part. Um, in order to map each value of an array um, using a function in idiomatic Go, first we have to create the result array using a make statement. Then we would by a range. Iterator iterate over the input and um, fill the result array and then print the result. Um, using the functional style, we can use the a.map function, which internally does the very same thing. Important part here is um, you pass the map function, the transformation function, and you get what you get back is another function that you can apply on your input. That's what you can see um, by the fact that the map function does not take two parameters. It takes one parameter and applies its result on the input. Reason for that is composability, as you can see in the, in the next slide. Um, from my perspective, um, it's easier to read. It, the, the use of the map abstract is easier to read in this case because it does not confront you with the details of how exactly you would have to iterate over your source data structure. You can, this is abstracted away. And if you understand what map does conceptually, you will also be able to understand what this line of code is doing. At the left-hand side, we see another example of the reduce function it follows the same concept um, in, the, in the first part. A reduce function takes um, a function that combines two subsequent values and a start value. So in the first case, we use the concat function of the sum monoid, which is just the plus operation. And we start with the value of zero and reduce then computes the sum over all integers. Um, we, uh, we can also use make use of 
the feature of a monoid that it not only carries the um, like the concrete operation, but also the start value by using a fold operation, which in this case takes the monoid itself. And it can imply the concrete function and the start value from it and apply it to the input feature and values. Um, so this is an overview of the set of monadic operations um, that's available. It's not 100% complete, but it gives you an idea. Um, so we have the, the typical function we will find in a, in a monad. We have the off function that creates a higher kind of type, map function, chain function. I've chosen the term chain in favor of bind or flat map, as you can find it in other languages, because um, as mentioned in the very beginning, uh, this is very influenced by FPTS and the FPTS library also used the chain function um, or the name chain for the flat map or the bind operation. Uh, but logically it, it's just a flat map. We have an apply function, flatten, reduce, so you might be familiar with many of these functions. And we have composition functions that allow you to write code in a flow, pipe and flow. Um, and here is, we see um, a consequence of uh, the lack of um, function overloading. Unfortunately, um, we have to create functions with that carry the number of parameters it's, they are taking in their name because we cannot overlay load them. This is why we have like the pipe n flow n function that can, that can practice its pipe one, pipe two, and so on. So you have to specify how many arguments they are, the, the function is taking um, to tell them the part. And this is how this would look uh, like. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, you have 10 minutes to set to. Okay, so le let me speed okay, up a bit and go, then maybe. Please go on with your slides anyway. Just <laughs> if it's possible. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I have. <laughs> we'll go through your presentation right. totally anyway, but please just speed up a bit. Thanks. I will speed up a bit. Okay, thank you. All right, so this illustrates um, the use of function composition. Um, in the left hand side, um, we can see that we have um, a sequence of a filter and a map operation. And now it also makes sense why these operations return functions and not take two parameters, because by returning higher order functions, we can easily compose them in such a flow. So when we read this program, we can start with the input value. The next step would be a filter operation, a map operation, and we can easily uh, understand what's happening in this um, piece of code. We're just following the composition. Uh, we can also do the same without specifying the input value, which, can, which you can see at the right hand side. And this is interesting for point freestyle, where, you, where we try to write functions that do not have to explicitly specify a name of an input variable. And it's basically just replacing a pipe function by a flow function and removing the first parameter. In this case, the result of the flow will be another function that takes the same input as the first operator and returns the same output as the last operator. Quick word about immutability. Um, Go does not have a way to enforce immutability, but there are some interesting aspects in Go that, that we, we, can, we can use. First, um, if you write getters and setters on functions, um, go as a way to pass objects or structures uh, by copy, as you can see in this example. So if you write an associated function, like a getter for a particular field on a, on a structure, on a data structure, in this case, the get name, um, and we, we pass the, the struct itself as, as, not as a pointer, but as the object itself, then go with create a copy and by modifying that copy, we are not modifying the original value. So this is already a good way to be able to, uh, to work with immutable data structures. But sometimes data structures are just too deep and you don't want to create a full copy. In this case, the optics implementation of the FPGO library helps out. Um, the optics implementation 
um, can create lenses and um, modifiers on lenses on data structures and the implementation makes, to, makes sure to only copy those portions of the data structure that are really modified um, by a lens or an optional or, or whatever, whatever optics concept, concept we use. As an example here, we have the same person data structure as before. We use the L, L for lens dot modify operation with, with, a, with a callback that increments a value, in this case, the age, and the implementation makes sure to copy the relevant parts of the data structure and return at the correct value. Right, let me skip this example in the interest of time because I would definitely want to um, talk about error handling. Errors in Go are represented using um, an error interface. And um, what's nice in Go, or what's one features in Go, errors are always handled explicitly, never as exceptions. So a function that can, a that can error out returns a data structure, uh, which basically returns a multi-value return value with the actual data type and an error object. And the caller is supposed to handle this in every single case, typically via an if-else statement. In FBGO, this is where we deviate from the idiomatic Go style, because in FBGO, we represent errors via an either data structure with this E, which is either an error or the actual value. And then we use the composition functions, like map filter, compose, chain, whatever, to handle these errors instead of doing this via if-else statements. The example can be seen here. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the top example, um, you can see this make URL function, which, uh, which does a sequence of operations. It converts um, like a string to an integer, then validates that the integer is a port number, so it's positive basically, and then it formats it as a string. And you can see we can use the flow operation and just just chain one operation after the other by using the standard chain and map operations and the flow operator without explicit error handling. In idiomatic Go style, um, every operation, every equivalent operation would return the value and an explicit error object. And you would have to, ch to check for the error object explicitly and bail out at that time. And um, yeah, and bail out at that time. Um, since one of the goals of this library is to be able to integrate into existing ecosystems, it's also very important that the library offers a way to switch between worlds, I would say, switch between the functional world and the imperative um, or the, the idiomatic Go world. And for the places where we deviate, in particular for error handling, there exist conversion functions that convert idiomatic Go functions that return like a multi-return value of value and error into a function that returns an either or equivalently functions that return value and a Boolean, which is Go's concept to deal with optional values into an option um, object in Go and vice versa. So it's relatively easy to use existing functions and also to expose functions written um, using the FPGO library um, as functions to the idiomatic Go world. Right, so I'm running a bit short, but I would definitely want to talk about managed side effects, if that's possible. Um, in the FPGO library, um, and we were trying to to make to tell functions that have side effects apart from functions that do not have side effects by introducing the type the IO type. The IO type is just a function that does not have any input but that returns an output. And the idea is that this makes it very clear that this must be a function with a side effect because how else other than the trivial constant function can a function return a sensible output if it does not have any input? This can only be true if the function has some side effects, such as reading from a database, a file, or uh, making an HTTP call. And already by having this data structure plus all of the 
monadic operations on this data structure, we can easily separate out pure functions from side effect for functions. A quick example is here. This is, a this is an example that reads a number of files. Um, and you can see um, the IOE prefix here stands for IO either. Um, again, we have the same um, composition functions map a chain um, to handle um, composition of the, the composition of operations. Um, and in this very example, uh, we are reading um, like a text file, a JSON file, and then we are combining these files to a result type. And the, one of the interesting parts here is this sequence operation, the sequence T2, two, because we have to, we have this numbering problem because of the lack of uh, function overloading, T stands for tuple. Um, and the sequence operation actually makes sure to operate the input operations like as, yeah, in, in a unit, let's put it that way. The default implementation is for IO operations to run the input IO operations concurrently because Go has such a powerful concurrency concept and it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to run IO operations concurrently for, from performance reasons. It is also possible to run oper IO operations um, in parallel uh, not in parallel, uh, uh, sequentially, if that's desired, but the default implementation is uh, concurrent. So this makes it really easy um, to come up with a system that uh, scales well uh, across I.O. operations because concurrent I.O. for these I.O. monads is actually built into the library. All right, I skip this in the interest of time, save for this. Final, kind of a final word on performance con uh, considerations. Um, the primitive operations such as map on arrays have a very similar performance uh, characteristic compared to native implementation in Go. So this shows a performance of a benchmark um, for a map operation on an array compared to the idiomatic operation. It's basically identical from a performance. Um, in case we have more complex um, operations, it turns out that the fact that the FBGO library returns higher order functions can have a negative side effect on performance if you measure performance um, on the micro scale. So if the actual operation that implements your business logic is extremely fast, then there can be an overhead of composing functions using FPGO. And as an example, I have here uh, in, the, in the top, a map and filter operation. Uh, the sample code is in, actually in the, in the open source project for this um, with, with a filter predicate that is very fast, just an is even operation. In that case, the idiomatic operation, the idiomatic implementation is much faster. But in case the actual filter predicate is a bit slower, such as checking if, a, if an integer is a prime and not just if it's even, then it's, it doesn't really play a role. The, the fact that idiomatic seems to be faster, uh, it, it, idiomatic is still a bit faster, but no, it's, it's just vice versa, sorry. That it looking, it seems that function is faster in this case, but that's, I would say, a, um, an artifact of my benchmark. It just doesn't play a role in this case. And since, Many operations in real world are really bound by IO operations, so op or, or business operations that are not that fast. The overhead that this library introduces is, in my experience, acceptable because it is visible on a micro scale, but not on a macro scale. And of course, it really shines if it comes to executing operations. Uh, I/O operations um, because per default it does this sequential uh, uh, concurrently, and of course in here have another I have another benchmark, um, of course tailored to show to show that example. Uh, doing a sequential operation is of course much slower than doing it concurrently, 
But since it's so easy to implement it concurrently using the FPGO library, using IO operations, I would say that's one of the major um, advantages of using these patterns. This, in fact, actually concludes my presentation. I'm sorry for running over a bit. Um, you can find examples. Uh, all examples are, I was showing here, also in the open source project uh, on, in the given link, plus many more. I've also uh, converted the <coughs> examples of Professor Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming, which is a fun read, actually, uh, to FPGO. So you can follow that book and uh, compare how it looks at an FPGO. And since it's so similar to FPTS, many of the tutorials you find for FPTS also apply to FPGO. So with this slide of references, I would conclude my presentation. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. And uh, maybe we have a minute or two for questions. And then I would hand over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karsten. Very interesting. It was a very good presentation and very cool with this. Like, a first, that you shared your like personal journey in in uh, <laughs> and also all the problems you ran into and lessons learned <laughs> from imperative programming, and then also very interesting present uh, the presentation or, or the graphs uh, uh, you showed around uh, performance consideration. That's also I think very interesting because using different strategies and different techniques w when you're solving different problems. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank Absolutely. You. I, I wanted to make, to point out, also point out, it's, so this library, I think it's, it's very good to go to implement functional styles to go, but it's potentially not a solution for everything. As you can see, if you're into micro benchmarks, then maybe uh, this is not what you want to use. All right, any questions? If you want to try this out and if you have questions after this presentation, just contact me via the repo. You can make comments on the repo and get in, in touch with me if you want to. Now I'm back. Yay. Oh, yeah, we have one question from the chat. Um, uh, do you have, do you know any, any plans of making FP in Go lighter? Like a lightweight FP Go? Um, to understand that question, I would have to understand what makes it heavyweight in the first yeah. place. <laughs> I would say, um, yeah, please, please share, share your, your thoughts about why you think it's, it's heavyweight with me. Um, you can use that, you can just use fractions of that library. If so, if, for example, if you don't buy into uh, the concept of error handling in either, uh, you don't have to use this. Um, the compiler makes sure to only include the portions you, you need. It's not that tightly integrated. But if you, for example, want to use the map reduce theorem, functions on, on slices or other helpful functions, but you can use just the portions of the library you need. Yes. Cool. Um, good. Thanks. I. There's no more questions in the chat. People are just saying thank you very much for your presentation. Also, some people are saying, I wished I had this library when I was writing Go. <laughs> so. Give it a Give it yes. a try and uh, let me know and get in contact. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karsten. And we'll put out all the reference uh, below in the press uh, below in the comments later in the, during under the presentations. Anyone can find all the all the good references you've given and also the reference to your uh, to the library to the FPGO library. So people. Thank you. Yes. With that. Thank you again very much, Karsten. With that, we head over to our next presentation of the day. We head over to Georgina and uh, ChatGPT as your Erlang coach. Welcome, Georgiana. Hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here <laughs> for the first time. 
Um, great, so I can start. So hello, my name is Georgiana. And today we are going to discuss how you can unlock the power of ChatGPT when you are learning a new programming language. And in this case, um, when you are learning Erlang. Uh, here is the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to discuss a bit about me, uh, what is the evolution of learning from my perspective, what is ChatGPT, how we can create a personalized study plan, what are um, the boundaries of using ChatGPT, and some final thoughts. So about me, um, I'm Georgiana, I'm Erlang developer at Crafting Software. I discovered Erlang uh, seven years ago. I'm passionate about learning, teaching, functional programming. Um, and um, other cool things. So here is a question for people uh, who are watching online. Uh, if you have ever used ChatGPT, most probably you've heard about it. So uh, let's go to the next part. Uh, what is the evolution of learning? Uh, first, we had a community. So most of the knowledge was passed uh, orally. You had to meet people, to discuss with them, to uh, discover um, what they uh, they know and how they can how you can learn from them. Uh, after that, uh, people started uh, writing the knowledge into books, and those book uh, books could be shared across uh, distance and generations, which was very great. Uh, later, we had the World Wide Web, the internet, which was a huge. Um, which uh, had a huge impact because uh, you you could have access to every online resource from everywhere uh, in this world. And in the past uh, few months, we have ChatGPT. So what is ChatGPT? Well, uh, it's a natural language processing tool, which was developed by OpenAI. And in a few days, uh, it reached um, one million of users in a very, very short period of time, which is incredible. Now you are asking, uh, but we already have search engines. Why do we need another tool uh, to do something similar? Well, there are a few differences between ChatGPT and a search engine. Uh, the search engine uh, retrieves web pages. It gives you the access to the full article and resources. Uh, the interaction is uh, query response based. So you enter uh, your query and you get a bunch of uh, results. Instead, ChatGPT is a bit different because with ChatGPT, you can actually have a conversation. And instead of giving you uh, the full um, article or the full resource, it can summarize the result and it's great that you can have a dynamic conversation with ChatGPT. And how ChatGPT works? Well, um, it's trained on um, the data we can find on the, on the internet. Good. So let's see how we can make uh, learning a bit more fun and easy. Uh, here we have... Um, <clears throat> We have asked ChatGPT to act as Donald Trump and to explain uh, what is the uh, Erlang behavior gen server. And let's see what is uh, the answer. Here we, uh, we can see, let's make it a bit bigger. We can see uh, the answer. So listen, Paul, gen server in Erlang, it's just incredible, absolutely fantastic. Everyone is talking about it. So it sounds like Donald Trump. And here we can see um, an explanation about handle call, which is a synchronous call, uh, handle cast, which is asynchronous, uh, handle info. So in this case, ChatGPT um, was able to behave like Donald Trump and give 
um, an explanation about the callbacks we have uh, in Germ server. And in case you want more details, you can um, uh, continue the conversation. Great. So now that we know how, uh, how to make things a bit more fun, let's see how we can uh, make things, things easier and um, easier to remember because sometimes maybe you don't like uh, you don't like Donald Trump and you like other characters. So you can use any other characters you like, um, characters from Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, Star Wars, you name it, uh, just to, to make things um, a bit different and more interesting. And in case you find concepts you don't fully understand, you can ask ChatGPT to explain um, those concepts to a five kids, uh, to a five years old kid. And here we have uh, the answer: what is uh, a supervisor? So the supervisor is like a superhero friend who makes sure everyone is doing their job correctly and safely. And if you think about the supervisor, well, that's uh, the job of the supervisor to ensure that processes are running correctly. And in case something happens um, to a process, uh, the supervisor acts as a superhero and restarts that process. Okay. Good, so now that you know how to uh, make things uh, a bit more interesting and easier when you are learning, let's see how you can create a study plan for you. So let's say that you are new to learning um, programming and you want to start uh, with Erlang. Here we have a conversation with ChatGPT where I ask to uh, help me to learn Erlang. And we can see here uh, the sections, understanding the basics, setting up Erlang, uh, a few uh, online tutorials and courses, uh, platforms to where you can practice uh, Erlang exercises is a very good platform for that. Um, an example of project, you can start uh, coding a reference to the communities because it's very important in case you have um, questions ChatGPT cannot ask, it's very important and very good to reach out to the community. Uh, some book recommendations, a few exercises, and here a code snippet about um, writing a factorial of a number in Erlang. But this is not enough. I want something um, for a specific period of time. Let's say I want a plan for days or for weeks with things I need to learn and uh, things to practice. So here uh, we can see that ChatGPT created a six week plan uh, for me to learn Erlang. We can see that is quite similar to what we've seen previously, but it's more um, detailed. We have the introduction and environment setup basic uh, syntax, processing and message passing, which is uh, new compared to the previous example, error handling and fault, tol fault tolerance, uh, open telecom platform. You can see here that this plan is more concrete and it provides more details about what you need to learn on, on, which week, on each week. Uh, good, but let's say that uh, you don't have six weeks to, to learn Erlang, you have only two weeks. Well, ChatGPT can um, tailor the plan for you. So here we can see the same plan as we've seen. Well, not the same plan, but the same concepts. But now they are covered in two weeks. Um, they're quite similar to what we've seen pre previously, uh, setting up and getting familiar with um, 
uh, with L rank, uh, data types and variables. Uh, this is the first week with basics um, about L rank. And the second week covers more advanced concepts um, in, uh, in L rank, like concurrency concepts, message passing, error handling, uh, the same um, concepts we've seen in the previous plan. And also some recommendations like learn, learn you some Erlang for a great good, which is a very good uh, resource of learning uh, Erlang. That's great. Uh, we have a two weeks plan, but let's say that uh, I also want to practice um, the information or the knowledge I'm, or the information I'm learning. Here, uh, I asked ChatGPT to create, again, uh, a two weeks plan, but now with some valid uh, resource links and small projects for each day. And we have, uh, we have the output. We can see here that uh, for each day, we have a small project. Uh, it's not a detailed project, but in case you want uh, ChatGPT to be more specific, you can ask further questions about each day and each uh, each project of the day. Good, so same as before, first week covers the, the basics and the second week covers the more advanced concepts. Great, and we also have some uh, resource links in case we want to um, go in deep up about um, those concepts. You can also ask ChatGPT about those concepts, but in case you want um, to see the source of truth, you can access those, uh, those links. Good. So now that you have a plan uh, for learning at rank, let's see how you can use ChatGPT to review your code because sometimes, uh, you are working, I don't know, maybe late uh, in the night or in the weekend and there is no one around to review your code. Let's see how you can we can use ChatGPT to uh, give some suggestions about how you can refactor your functions. So here we have a function uh, which, um, checks uh, if a host, uh, if the host is, um, which tries to resolve a host to find the, the IP. Uh, let's check this slide because um, it's highlighted better. Uh, we can see here that first is trying to resolve um, the host in case it doesn't, um, <clears throat> uh, it, in, in case it gets an error, it's trying to um, use uh, get address and after that get address, but with the parameter um, for the IPv6. We have three nested, three nested, nested cases. And I think this is a maximum um, level of uh, nested cases a programmer can read. But even though sometimes it's a bit harder to, to follow all those, all these cases. So let's see how ChatGPT refactored this function. We can see here that the function was split, split it uh, into two smaller one, ones, but we can see that it got rid of this case, which is understandable, but what ChatGPT doesn't know is that currently there are more IPv4 uh, addresses in use than IPv6. So it makes sense to try to uh, check if the address is IPv4 first instead of IPv6. It can um, make your code faster. So here, what I did was to challenge ChatGPT. And the answer is, yeah, you are correct, considering that there are more uh, IPv6 addresses in use, then this is um, the, the new refactoring. And we can see 
the same uh, three nested cases, but now they are. Um, but now we have three functions instead of those three nested cases, and it's a bit more readable than before. And the function names can give you more context about um, what the function does. So this is a great way to um, <clears throat> to find new ways uh, you can write the code. In case you are not happy uh, with the chat GPT output, you can ask to regenerate uh, the solution. Cool. So now that we have a plan, uh, we know how to use ChatGPT to review our code. Let's see how we can use ChatGPT to learn, <clears throat> sorry, uh, to learn things that you may find only by practicing a lot. So let's see, let's see what are some bad Erlang codes and what is the solution to them. So what I did here was to uh, ask ChatGPT to provide a few examples of writing bad code in Erlang. And here is the output, um, the lack of error handling. This is common, I would say, in almost every programming language. With the solution, uh, not using tele recursion. Uh, Erlang is a functional programming, so we rely a lot on um, on list, so sometimes you may uh, not be aware of um, of this. So be aware that you need to to use tail recursion. Uh, not using uh, building functions because there are a lot of building functions you uh, can use um, in deep Erlang uh, OTP instead of reinventing the wheel. Another one is hard coding uh, configuration uh, values. I would say that this is common in other languages, but I found one example, which is uh, specific for Erlang, ignoring unexpected messages in a process. You know that every message, which is not better match um, in the process will end up in the mailbox of the process. And that may cause um, the mailbox to become over overloaded with a lot of unhandled messages. And here is the solution. You pattern match the expected messages. And the last uh, pattern match is anything uh, that message could, um, could receive. Good. Let's go back to the presentation. Now that you also know how to find some, uh, how to mm, avoid um, the bad practices in, uh, in Erlang, of course, you can ask ChatGPT to provide uh, more examples. Let's see how you can create your first project using ChatGPT. So here I ask it to act as a coach and to guide me to create uh, my first Erlang project using some advanced uh, concepts. And here we can see uh, the concepts covered uh, in this, uh, in this uh, proposal, in this project idea, which is a distributed chat system. We can see concurrent uh, processes, message passing, fault tolerance, distribution. Uh, and now we can see the module for a user, which can join, um, we can join the chat. We can see here the, the loop for receiving messages, uh, the API for sending messages, receiving messages, also the chat room, um, the user can join and send and receive messages, the supervisor tree. But you can see here that there are no 
OTP behaviors in this example. So what I did was to ask ChatGPT to use gen server and supervisor behaviors because I've learned about them and I want to put them in practice. And here we can see the same project, but now using the gen server for the chat room and the actual uh, supervisor behavior uh, for supervising um, the chat room. Great, and here you can see how you can compile and run your code. Uh, some explanations about uh, the gen server, the supervisor, the strategy, strategy used for the supervisor. Um, and let's say that I've heard about rebar and I want to use it in my project. You can uh, ask ChatGPT to, um, to include um, this tool in your project. And now we can see that we can initialize the project using rebar and also some um, and also the other steps uh, to to work on the project, um, how you can uh, write your modules, how you can compile the project uh, with rebar, how you can run the shell and uh, start um, start uh, the distributed uh, chat uh, application, and also um, it also encourage you encourages uh, encourages you to test your modules because in the real world it's very important to test uh, your code. You cannot uh, write it and expect to. Um, to uh, one moment. Uh, you you cannot trust one hundred percent your code um, unless you you test it. So I also encourage you so to test the code. Okay. So now now we we've, we've seen uh, how to create. Um, a project using a ChatGPT, how you can tailor um, the project in case you want some specific behaviors, some specific tools. You can ask ChatGPT to um, to give you some examples of how you can integrate those tools or ideas in your project. Okay, so some of the boundaries or limitations of the chat GPT is that uh, sometimes it can hallucinate. In this case, I ask it to give me some examples of bad um, Erlang code. And this example is, is valid in proper error handling, but the solution is a bit weird. So here, is saying that consider using match macro. And I've never seen this macro in Erlang. So I asked ChatGPT, does that macro actually exist? And the answer was apology for the confusion. That macro doesn't exist in Erlang. So in, in case things doesn't make sense for you, challenge it because sometimes it can hallucinate um, when writing uh, the, the answer for the output. Okay, and let's see some final thoughts. When you are interacting with ChatGPT and you want to learn, um, in this case, Erlang, try to be specific about what you want and what you uh, really need to learn. Provide enough details about the ideas you have in mind. Try to shape the behavior. We've seen that you can ask ChatGPT to behave um, like a personality or like a character in case you want to make things uh, a bit more fun. Ask for valid resources because they are the source of truth. And iterate in case you don't get um, 
the expected output uh, for the first time, try to add more context or to be more specific or to regenerate the answer. So ChatGPT, as we've seen, is a powerful tool. It can create a plan specific for your needs and for the things uh, you want to learn. And <clears throat> it's very good as a body, but not as, a, an, as an expert. In case you have questions uh, chat GPT cannot, cannot answer or it gives you a uh, wrong um, output, I encourage you to reach out to the community because that's the place where you can find experts. And don't blindly trust it because as we've seen, sometimes uh, it can hallucinate and it, it can be frust frustrating sometimes, but um, in the end, it's just a tool and we are in the position to to tailor the answer uh, or to tailor the, the output chat GPT can give us. So in case something doesn't make sense, try to, to challenge it. And when you are learning a rank or any other language, try to not copy paste the code, even though those, uh, even though it's quite tempting, uh, don't be a copycat. Try to be a coding ninja. So write the code uh, by yourself. And remember that Rome wasn't built in a day. So it takes time to learn a new programming language. And um, ChatGPT can be your body in your in this journey. So use it but be aware of those uh, limitations. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Georgiana. Thank you. Very interesting topic. I had similar thought myself to use it as like, a, like how can I build like a simple curriculum to build, learn, <laughs> learn, learn people Erlang. <laughs> Done it. Very interesting. Uh, question, uh, do you use ChatGPT in your daily work as a coding buddy, coding coach, uh, or like checking, verifying, or mm. coming up with ideas? Sometimes when I'm not fully content with um, the solution I have, maybe it's not enough um, clear what I want to express uh, with that code. I try to chat, uh, use ChatGPT to refactor uh, the solution to make it more uh, readable. But um, in case you want ChatGPT to generate um, big pieces of code, well, in that case, uh, it can come with a lot of errors. So it might, it, it, sometimes it takes more time <laughs> to fix those errors than actually writing right, it. So it's very good for small, concrete, um ideas you want uh to to generate yes have you used chat... and, uh, uh, sorry go yeah, on yeah. no please go on uh, no no yeah please continue yeah uh, question like have you used it yourself to learn more erlang or, or deep dive into any topic um yes uh well mm, not at the full potential, I would say, but sometimes I have curiosities or in case I forget um, things about Erlang, I uh, I go to chat GPT and ask about it. But um, I try to read the articles on the internet, which are written by real humans, uh, <laughs> because I can fully trust those articles. But in case I want something fast, um, I just go to ChatGPT and ask it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I, I was asked uh, at some point if ChatGPT can uh, replace the trainers. Well, I wouldn't say to replace them, but the trainers can um, use it as a tool to 
uh, create a good curriculum uh, for their uh, training. So it, it's a tool, I would say, but we shouldn't fully rely on it. We still, um, we still need to be aware that um, it can uh, give you wrong answers sometimes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Or hallucinate mm -hmm. or, or make up fake code. Yeah. Or stupid <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Or, or to, to give you a code which is a combination of Erlang and Elixir. <laughs> oh, no. It happened to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Have you seen any um, like juniors using ChatGPT to get started in Erlang? Or trained? In combination with, with trainers or like in in person or a trainer or a teacher? Uh, not yet, no? but um, I would love to to see juniors trying to use Erlang. Uh, we had an internship uh, last this at the beginning of this year. No, last year um, in our company. But at that time, uh, ChatGPT wasn't available, so we couldn't use it. But in case we are uh, organizing a new internship, I would like to use ChatGPT for uh, creating for creating some presentations and also uh, to to organize a bit uh, the information we want to to share with the interns. So I I. I I have some plans to use it in the future. Nice. Uh, it, it's, it would be really interesting to see, like, as you say, like a trainer plus ChatGPT and see if you can really evolve things faster and get people to learn quicker, faster, push push the limit of learnings with help of mm -hmm. ChatGPT as a tool, not as, <laughs> not as a replacement of coders or trainers or etc. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I don't have any further questions. Thank you again very much, Georgiana, for your presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Magnus. You're welcome. And with that, I would like to thank everyone watching tonight. And again, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we'll be back again in the 5th of December. Uh, so welcome then. And have a nice evening, day or morning, wherever you are. Goodbye. <laughs>